Hey guys, so in this video we're going to be going over chapter 22, so this is specifically over infections of the digestive tract. So let's go ahead and get started. It's kind of a long lecture, but I'm going to try to make it as short as possible. So first off, let's just discuss the basic anatomy of the digestive system. The digestive system does start in our mouth, so with our teeth, our tongue, our throat, all of that, and then our throat will travel down with our esophagus into our stomach, our um, intestines, both small and large. So we're going to focus mainly on the mouth, stomach, and intestines. We're not going to really focus um, anywhere else. We're not going to focus on like teeth or anything. Um, I don't really do a lot of tooth stuff. But the one thing that I do want you to know about two, about your teeth is that there is such thing as tooth decay. And tooth decay is where a plaque is, starts forming biofilm. Just because you have plaque on your teeth doesn't necessarily mean that there is actual disease present. But um, normally what it is is that there is a, a layer that are that is on top of your teeth and it's normally comprised of strep and lactobacilli. Some Sometimes there's other species but those are the two main ones. And then if you do have dental plaque or cavities, this is where the biofilm is actually starting to cause harm. So um, as the bacteria is not kept in check, then it's metabolizing because it, it's a living organism. And while it's metabolizing, it's actually producing a lot of acid. And that acid can actually cause um, your tooth to start decaying. And when your tooth starts decaying, it ruins the enamel, which is kind of like the shield on your teeth. And then once the enamel on your tooth is destroyed in that area, you get a cavity. Now, that's just for the teeth. Um, but for the gums, um, there's something called gingivitis and periodontal disease. So gingivitis is where you have the inflammation of your gums. Um, almost everybody has some degree of gingivitis for the most part. Some more than others. It kind of just depends. But whenever you have gingivitis is whenever your gums around your teeth is destroyed. Now, with periodontal disease, this is where the, um, the excessive inflammation has caused the gums to excessively bleed and pull away from your teeth. So that's when you have periodontal disease. Most of us, at, at least at our age, don't have it. And the below are the two species that commonly cause it. I'm not going to attempt to say it. <laughs> it's a rather nasty <laughs> name but just know the difference between gingivitis and periodontal so with gingivitis you just have slight inflammation periodontal is where you actually have the retreating of gums and excessive bleeding okay so next we're going to talk about something that's called oral thrush so this is commonly caused by a yeast strand called canada albicans now there are other strands that can cause um, oral thrush of Canada, but the most common one is albicans, and it is very, very common in newborns as well as elderly patients. So uh, it's very common in newborns because they don't have that robust um, flora yet since they are relatively new, new. And then also patients who are taking antibiotics will commonly get a yeast infection, whether it be of the mouth or the vaginal tract if, if, she's a, if the patient is a female. So the reason why they'll commonly get a yeast infection is because those antibiotics are wiping out all the good bacteria that commonly keeps it in check. And it's normally wiping out lactobacilli. And lactobacilli definitely keeps Canada in check, whether it be Canada albicans or other Canada, Canada species. Just depends. But the most common one, like I said, is albicans. So now let's actually talk about some gastrointestinal uh, syndromes. So the most common syndrome that you will see is diarrhea. And diarrhea, there is different types. So diarrhea just itself is defined as um, having loose stool at least three times a day. So loose stool meaning that it's more water-based than solid-based. So that's the general definition, but there are four other types that I do want you to know. I just want you to know the definitions. So the first one we're going to talk about is osmotic. So this is where the osmolarity of your, <clears throat> excuse me, in, of your intestinal content 
is higher than the internal osmolarity of your mucosal lining, meaning that there's more water in the exterior environment than actually inside your cells. So there's less water inside your cells, so water leaves. And whenever that's the case, a lot of times nutrition absorption is inhibited. So it is, um, you, you are not absorbing as much as you should. Now with secretatory, this is a little different. This has to do with the cells. They increase in ion um, secretion, meaning that they are um, allowing ions to leave the cell when they're not supposed to be leaving the cell. So um, pathogens, they will actually do this. So what they'll do is that they will somehow signal the cell to allow ions to leave. And this is where you'll have like electrolyte imbalance. Now there's inflammatory um, diarrhea. So this is where your mucosal lining is severely inflamed and this is where there, a lot of damage is occurring to your intestinal lining or your mucosa cells in that region. And then with your cells being damaged or even undergoing death, you are not absorbing your nutrients and if it's severe enough, you can actually have bloody stool. This is very common in Shigella and Salmonella. So it's very common um, with those pathogens. Now there's motility related. So this is where your food moves way too quickly throughout your digestive system. You, are, you do not absorb any nutrients. And a lot of times this will happen whenever a toxin is being produced or it's caused by the rotavirus. Okay. So with that, let's go ahead and go into more conditions or more syndromes of the tract. So there's gastritis. So this is where there's inflammation within your stomach. Then there's gastroenteritis. This is where you have inflammation along your gastrointestinal tract, so along the entire system. And then you have entreitis. This is where you have inflammation primarily within your small intestines. Then you have entercolitis. This is where it's a region of your small intestines as well as your colon and then you have colitis which is solely your colon so this is just some verbiage so whenever we do mention some of it you know what region we are talking about okay so let's talk about the rotavirus and norovirus so the rotavirus this spreads through the fecal oral route and normally it lasts for only like two two or so days um, it's normally affected within children, and they are the most severely um, infected as well, affected, sorry, affected. So what happens is that the virus will encode for a toxin, and then that will increase hypermotility within the intestinal tract. So this is where uh, your intestinal tract will be acting faster than normal, so this is why you'll get some diarrhea. Um, sometimes it can actually stimulate the vagus nerve, which is specifically for your gag reflex, and it can actually cause vomiting. And there is a vaccine to prevent um, this disease. So that's the, the rotavirus, rot rotavirus, sorry. And then we have the norovirus. So this is more commonly found um, on cruise ships since it is very close quarters on cruise ships. But what will happen is that it will spread through the oral fecal route and it's normally self-limiting, so it only lasts for about a day, but the symptoms are very quick, very, um, they onset very, very quickly, and normally causes a spike in fever, um, a headache, and general malaysia. There is a video link right here. I'm not going to show it, just so um, save time on the video, but you're more than welcome to go look at it for yourself. Okay, so now let's talk about hepatitis. So hepatitis, this is specifically inflammation of the liver. I believe this is the only disease that we're going to talk about that affects the liver. There are other diseases, but we're going to focus on hepatitis because we will see him again in the reproductive, um, reproductive chapter. But for hepatitis, there are different kinds. Some of them we do have vaccines to, but hepatitis C, we don't have a vaccine yet, but it is in development. Um, but depending on specifically what hepatitis um, that a patient has will determine what type of pathogen, how is it transmitted, as well as does it cause chronic liver disease. And if it does cause chronic liver disease, then a lot of times some, 
somebody who has hepatitis, um, if they are autopsied, then this is what their liver will look like. It is essentially eaten away. It's degraded, it's destroyed. And this is a healthy liver on the left hand side. Now I'm not going to ask you specifically like how is it, um, like how does the pathogen actually cause it or what pathogen. I mainly just want you to know the idea of it. So um, hepatitis for the most part can be passed like parentally meaning um, through generations like if somebody is infected it can be transmitted through a mother to child or it can be transmitted through oral fecal route and then hepatitis B is the only one that is STI meaning that you can get it through sexual contact okay now one more thing about hepatitis I do want you to know this slide so if I were to give you this table I would want you to be able to um, interpret this table based on these results so if I gave you these results I would want you to be able to read this table so interpret it and tell me what is the patient's diagnosis so let's go ahead and do the first one so the first one is negative negative positive so let's go and look negative negative positive so that is this one right here so this means that they are immune due to being vaccinated so that would be the diagnosis and that is what I would want you to do I would want you to be able to interpret those results as well as translate and interpret the table and tell me what is the outcome for that patient. Okay, so that will be on the test. That will be a test question, guys. Also, we have um, peptic ulcers. So peptic ulcers is commonly caused by H. pylori or Heclobacter pylori. So um, it will cause an ulcer, meaning that it will start... Um, causing severe inflammation on the mucosal lining within the stomach and then sometimes it even creates a hole in the stomach depending on if it's extremely um, severe. Um, for the most part peptic ulcers um, they are found along the lower part of the stomach. They can be found elsewhere but they're generally on the lower part. And then common um, diagnosis process is urea breath or bacterial culture so what you'll do is that um, you'll have somebody breathe and then based on that um, they will test for the urease present in their breath and then if it is detected you just do some anti um, antibiotics and you're good to go for the most part okay so here is some um, common infections that will happen throughout the digestive tract. So normally within the small intestines, you'll have some E. coli infections, salmonella, um, some vibro, listerella, and then within the large intestines, you'll have the C. diff and then also different types of E. coli and shigella. And we're going to talk about each of these um, for the most part individually. Some of them we won't even talk about. Okay. So for E. coli though, there are different classes on how to um, differentiate between them. So E. coli, so if you see E. T. E. C. so that's enterotoxigenic E. coli, this specifically will produce a toxin and it will cause secretatory and water diarrhea. There is no known animal reservoir, so meaning that it will only infect humans, it doesn't live with inside animals. And then we have EIEC, so this is entro, entro invasive E. coli, so this will cause the bloody diarrhea, so that means that there's inflammation within the intestinal tract. And it's very, very similar to the presentation of Shigella, and we'll talk about Shigella in the next few slides. And then we have E. coli, um, um, entro hemorrhagic E. coli, so EHEC. So this specifically will produce a shiga toxin. Not, e not all E. coli have shiga toxins. So this will also cause severe um, bloody diarrhea. It's very similar to the previous one that we talked about. Um, but normally it's associated with an animal reservoir. Meaning that um, it's more common in animals as compared to humans. And then a lot of times this will lead to... Um, excessive clotting within the liver, not within the liver, within the kidneys, and then also there can be clotting within the circulatory system. So that's just three of them. Those are um, 
three of the major classes of the six that we will talk about or that we just did talk about. Now we're going to talk about Shigellosis. So Shigellosis is specifically caused by Shigella um, species. Shigellosis will cause bloody diarrhea all the time. And it's very similar to the EIEC. They, they infect the exact same. Um, there is no known animal reservoir, so it's transmitted um, from, from humans via contaminated food or water with, that is contaminated with fecal matter. And if one does get shigellosis, then they'll have extreme abdominal cramping, high fever, vomiting, and they will have excessive watery diarrhea with blood present. And shigellosis is treatable. Um, depending on if the shigella species is caught is producing a uh, a lot of toxins so almost all shigella species will produce a toxin but depending on how much um, it's being produced will also determine treatment plan so here's the general way shigella will infect so he will evade so meaning that he has to be intake so once he intakes he, he will attach specifically to M cells he'll enter in he will do a phagosome lysis so he will start rupturing the phagosomes he will escape the cell so that is how he he's able to infect he's able to evade our immune system by escaping the phagosomes and he escapes into the cytoplasm and then he will move throughout he will then um, reinfect other cells and continue on and then eventually as more cells are infected there is damage of the epithelial cells and with the damage um, it's promoting inflammation which will promote that bloody diarrhea and then Shigella is normally not deadly um, but I imagine there has been some cases but for the most part um, you can provide supportive care as well as antibiotics and you are normally okay within a week or so. Okay, so like I said, I do have a video about uh, Shigella, but I'm not going to play it, but definitely look at it. It gives a good idea on how Shigella actually causes infections. Okay, now we're going to talk about Salmonella. So this um, disease is normally caused by two major um, presentation so either in typhoid fever or enterocolitis so if typhoid fever is present then there's no animal reservoir so meaning it's transmitted from human to human and normally it's associated with poor food preparation so if the food is con contaminated then typhoid fever may occur if, if the salmonella species is present and it does cause um, severe diarrhea and fever for about two to three weeks you can treat it. Um, you can treat it with some um, with some medications. You can, but sometimes um, you don't need to. It kind of just depends. But for the most part, um, you will get um, medications for it. But then you have enterocolitis. So this is where you normally come in contact with a contaminated animal, normally with poultry or reptiles. It's normally self-resolving within two days and all you do is provide supportive care. So if you have um, diarrhea associated with this, a lot of times you'll just keep rehydrating so you can essentially f in a way flush it out so you don't get dehydrated. So that's the difference um, between two salmonella presentations. So here's a a figure on how they actually attach so it's kind of like the same in terms of shigella so salmonella will attach to the m cells as well and they will invade and then based on how they invade they'll go two different routes so one will go through they'll actually start replicating and then if they replicate they will continue to exit throughout the cell sometimes they'll just stay within the cell but for the most part they will replicate exit and then what will happen is that depending on if your body will pick it up, um, a macrophage will, will completely kill it off and you're good to go, which is normally what will happen. Um, but sometimes it can disseminate and actually go into the lymphatic system. And then with that, 
the bacteria can then spread via circulation through like the lymphatic system as well as the blood vessels. But that's if the macrophage doesn't kill it off. So the macrophage can go either two ways. It can either be like you are going to die or eh, you're okay but I'm going to travel to the lymphatic system. So ideally you don't want your macrophage to go to the lymphatic system. You want it to resolve and kill off the strand. But what will happen is that if you have the typhoid fever, it will almost always disseminate. So if you have the non-typhoid fever, so if you have the enterocolitis, that's why it's self-resolving and only takes about two days to clear. But if you have the typhoid fever one, it'll disseminate. So ideally, you don't want the typhoid fever. So here's also a video about it. Not going to show it, but definitely take a look at it. Okay, now we have Campylobacter enterocolitis. So this is normally caused by the Campylobacter species, um, not species, genus, um, but it's the number one cause for diarrhea in the world. It's commonly found on poultry and cattle. So it's, it's transmitted through undercooked meat, unpasteurized milk. So a lot of people who work with cattle, they, they are definitely predisposed to it based on occupational hazard, but also can also be for us because we didn't properly clean our meat or properly cook our chicken. That's why chicken needs to be cooked through and through. There has to be no pink. It's not like steak. If this does happen to you, it's self-limiting. So you just provide supportive care and you're okay. But if you have an immunocompromised patient, it can definitely disseminate. So you don't want um, the disease to spread to other organs because if other organs get infected it can definitely cause a cascade event. It can be very detrimental to them. Also it can cause the autoimmune disease that we talked about the Julian Barr syndrome. We talked about that I think two lectures ago where it will cause um, your I believe it's your lymphocytes your, your lymph nodes to swell your B cells get attacked. Now, common syndromes of this is numbness, um, tingling in the hands and feet. Um, you'll have muscle weakness on both sides of your body. You can have difficulty speaking, um, chewing or swallowing, and then also severe back pain. So if you see a patient that has that, then you definitely want to treat them right away because then it can lead to something else, and we don't want that. Okay, so now let's talk about cholera. So cholera, this is caused by Vibro um, cholera. It is a gram-negative bacterium. It has a single flagella. It is transmitted through the oral, fe um, oral fecal route through contaminated water. Um, so with cholera, it does cause massive watery diarrhea. It's also known as rice water stool. Um, so that is why I commonly... Um, if you, like in a developing country where they have a cholera outbreak, they have these things called cholera beds because the patient unfortunately cannot hold their bowel movement. So that is why they have um, a potty hole in the middle of the beds in order to allow the patient to defecate and not have to move. Um, it is considered non-invasive, so that means that it won't cause fever, it won't cause any bloody stool. It will just cause the the excessive watery stool, as well as the uh, sorry, lost my train of thought. As well as um, the secretory diarrhea, if a toxin is produced. So not all cholera is toxin related. So if it's non-toxic or non-toxin cholera, it's just watery diarrhea. But if there is cholera toxin present, then it's secretory. Um, secretatory diarrhea. Now there is non-cholera bivro, so this is normally seen in seafood and coastal areas. Um, it's also very common in um, wound pathogens. So if you have the, the non-cholera vibro, then a lot of times it will happen and it will um, cause um, necr necrosis of the of the tissues, so such as the, the last one. But that's with non-cholera vibro. Okay, 
So now let's talk about intestinal diseases that are caused specifically by gram-positive bacteria. So if it's caused by a gram-positive, it's less common than gram-negative because all the ones we talked about before are gram-negative. Um, they're more or most related to toxins that they are produced. So the most common ones, um, gram-positive bacteria that causes um, intestinal disease is Listerella, Clostridium, and Staphylococcus. So let's look at Listerella or Listerosis. So this is caused by a Coctobacilli. It is associated with animals. It does have an animal reservoir and it's normally linked to unpasteurized dairy. So there is actually a Listerella outbreak with Bluebell ice cream. I believe it was, it was a while ago, but there was an outbreak where um, the milk or the dairy within their product actually wasn't pasteurized completely. And there was a small Listerella um, outbreak. So what will happen is that it'll cause mild um, gastroenteritis in, in healthy patients. But if you have an, a, an immune compromised patient, it can actually disseminate and actually even cause septemia. So that can be very deadly, especially if it turns into um, sepsis or septic shock. But what happens is that the bacteria, he will live inside the macrophages to avoid our immune system. Um, it, it can um, pass um, from mother to child or mother to fetus. So it, there is some um, vertical transmission, but it's not very often, but it can definitely happen. So that's just a little bit about listerosis. Now let's talk about colitis. So this is normally associated with Clostridium or C. diff. So this is an endospore forming bacteria. So it is very difficult um, to disinfect and it causes um, pseudomembranous colitis. So this is only within the colon or it can also be a part of the colon and small intestines. In that case, it will be called pseudomembranous enterocolitis. So C. diff, like I said, it is actually really common. Um, it is associated a lot of times with, um, with like orange foul smelling stool. Hopefully none of y'all will ever smell C. diff. We've kind of smelt it in the lab, but it is completely different when it's a patient. And just FYI, a little trick to help with the smell, rub alcohol underneath your nose with the little alcohol wipes. It helps, but it doesn't get rid of the smell. Just FYI. Um, but a common risk factor for getting C. diff infection is cr chronic antibiotic use. So what will happen is that if you are using um, antibiotics so often, what, what you're doing is that you're stripping away your good flora. And with that, C. diff will cause an infection. And it's often seen as a nosocomial infection um, because um, sometimes there's equipment that isn't properly cleaned or disinfected um, within the hospital population. Um, common treatment is vancomycin, um, but it can also be treated with something called a fecal transplant. So there is a lot of studies that actually show that what you'll do is that you have a suppository, which is a pill that you stick up your rectum. And what it, what it does is that that good fecal matter has the good bacteria in it. And what it will do is that it will replenish the patient's good flora. And with the good flora replenished, C. diff will then not be able to cause disease or cause infection. So there's actually a lot of good studies on that and it does have a lot of promising results. So um, you're not just taking fecal matter and putting up somebody's, um, putting up another patient's rectum, but what happens is that you will, somebody will donate their, um, will donate their um, and poop. Sorry guys, I was trying to think of a better word. Um, will donate their poop and then what will happen is that that their, their sample will be purified and cleaned and made sure that only the good bacteria is present and then it'll be transformed into like a capsule and then that capsule will then be um, placed into the patient's rectum so that the good bacteria can persist. Okay, so that's C. diff. Now let's talk about staph food poisoning. So staphylococcus, we know that he, he will produce a toxin um, a lot of times he will produce a toxin during food handling and with that he will 
intoxicate the food so he'll make the food quote unquote drunk or contaminated and then um, what will happen is that you will ingest that food and then after ingestion um, if toxins are present within the food that you took up then you will have um, fever um, a lot of times if you have um, if you have an immunocompromised patient it can actually cause um, severe um, non-specific t-cell proliferation but it will happen in a normal healthy patient but it can be more detrimental if you have an immunocompromised patient and this um, this food poisoning, it's a little difficult to treat because that toxin is heat stable. So meaning that even if you cook your meat very well, the toxin may still be present. Now Staphylococcus, he will die, but his toxin will live on. And that's actually what is causing the disease, not directly the Staph aureus. Because once you ingest it, if Staph is still present on the food when you're ingesting it, Staph will get degraded in your intestinal tract because he can't live in there, but the toxin can live. But normally, it's self-limiting and you're okay. Okay, so now let's talk about parasites. I'm not a big fan of parasites, so I'm just going to give you the bare bones. So we have the first one. It's a flagella per, uh, protozoa. So this... He will cause diarrhea. He is associated with fresh water being contaminated with fecal matter. Um, so normally um, somebody is asymptomatic and then they will defecate and then that water will get contaminated and somebody else will uptake. Um, normally it's associated with children in the U.S. and daycare centers. They are carriers. Um, common way to um, diagnose it is through a fecal sample and then what they'll do is that they will look at the sample to see if there's any cyst present so any of the protozoa present and then if so then you will treat it with ormethrozole and then you're good to go it's not that big of a deal but it's normally transmitted through contaminated um, food water because of fecal matter okay so now we got some worms. So um, if you see the word helimythic, so that, that means worms, it's a fancy word for worms. Um, I believe we are going to talk about roundworm, tapeworm, and flatworm. I don't believe we're going to talk about flutes. Um, flutes are more common in like Asian countries, not so much stateside. Um, but general symptoms, if you have a worm infection, um, what will happen is that you'll have some inflammation because the worm will... Um, generally a worm will promote um, pro-inflammatory um, environment um, but not all of them and then a lot of times um, what will happen is that you will start feeling very like weak or something um, you'll always have cramping something of that nature and then you'll go to the doctor and then sometimes depending on what it is they'll um, do a stool sample and then that is how they'll diagnose you is through a stool sample normally or on some of them which we'll see later you can actually physically see them and um, that's another way of being diagnosed so this is um, the life cycle of some worms I'm not going to expect you to know these verbatim but I do want you to know the idea so the idea is is that the human will ingest the worm or somehow the parasite will penetrate the the host and then larva will happen with larva being present um, they will go to whatever area that they are destined for so depending on which worm you have will determine where do they go so such as in roundworm they go to the intestine in hook and roundworm they go to the heart lung and mouth and then eventually they can go to the intestines. And then with tapeworm, they stay in the intestinal system. And then with flutes, they go to the liver primarily and the bile duct. And then once they're there, they will mature. And then those mature worms, they will what they'll do is that they will produce progeny, so eggs. And then those eggs will travel through um, the fecal root, so they'll be defecated out. And then that is how they get reintroduced back into the environment. So that's pretty much the big picture that I want you to know. 
for the life cycle of a parasite. Okay, so let's talk about tapeworms. Tapeworms are pretty nasty, um, but they are pretty cool and, in my opinion, kind of cute. But um, with tapeworms, they're kind of unique in their structure because they are flat. They are literally flat, elongated, segmented worms. So meaning that they are, they have individual little sections. They are not one continuous thing. Um, they are intestinal parasites. They can grow extremely big. Um, but you, you, what they do is that they will absorb food through their little suckers. So they will, they whatever food you are intaking, they will uptake as well and their bodies they actually can self fertilize because they are both male and female at the same time so they have both uh, male and female parts in one segment and what will happen is that these segments will break off they will mature they will self fertilize each other and then create more of themselves so those segments are like mini versions of them and that is how they will reproduce so a segment will break off once it's matured so what will happen is that fertilization of essentially a fertilization will occur between the male and female within the segment it will mature and then it will break off and release eggs so this is the general life cycle of a tapeworm like i said i'm not too concerned about you knowing specifically each one but i do want you to know the big bullet points that i have on the slides so the eggs will pass through the host um, they'll, um, through the through fecal matter and then what will happen is that the host will ingest those eggs and they will become larva and then those larva will then be ingested by another host and then the adult phase will start over again. It's a very very simple life cycle for all of them. I do have a video about it about the, the monster inside of me. Um, if y'all want go ahead and watch it. It's a it's a pretty fascinating video. I hope y'all like Animal Planet stuff. <laughs> but let's talk about our next worm. So we are going to talk about nematodes. So specifically the round worm. So what happens is that the egg passes through the fetus, uh, fetus <laughs> through the fecal matter. They are immature at that at that point. Then they'll go to their larval stage, so they'll be slightly more matured. Then to a cyst stage, and then at that point. Um, they can actually go outside of the host, but not always, or sometimes they will stay inside the host. And then if they go outside the host, then ingestion will occur again, and that is how they will um, enter the host and then develop into the adult stage again. Like I said, it's a very, very simplified process. But here is a video about them as well. Definitely look at it. It's pretty fascinating. But let's talk about, I believe we have one more worm, and then that will be it. So we have one more. So I believe it's produced as Sicarius. Um, but this one is the most um, common worm infection worldwide. Um, this one is actually diagnosed because what will happen is that the worm will actually emerge from specific orf orifices. So it, you can actually see it in the back of your throat or it will come out your nose or even your anus and actually that is how you reinfect yourself so what will happen is that while you're sleeping if it comes out like your bum or if it comes out your nose you get an itch because you know something is kind of wiggling there and it's itchy so what will happen is that you'll itch it and then at that point eggs are actually present especially if you are scratching your bum eggs are present and then what will happen is that you may accidentally scratch your face and if you scratch your face then the eggs are back in the nose and mouth area then you re-ingest and then it just starts all over again they can grow very very big and they can live um, part in partially undigested food so like I said you'll reinfect yourself and then the cycle will just continue and this is actually might of what happened to this patient, why they have so many, um, so much worms. Now, depending on how much worms are present, will determine how do you get rid of them. So some of them you can take anti-parasitics uh, and you're okay. But if you have a lot of worms, like where you are just completely essentially covered with worms internally, sometimes surgery is needed. And surgery some is very commonly needed for this 
for the worm that we just talked about. And there is a video right here. It's not for the faint-hearted. I believe I showed it in class, but it's a very, very fascinating video. But then here is also a video about it um, with the monster inside. So definitely take a look at those guys. Um, with that last wormy, that will wrap up our lecture. So we talked about the basic anatomy of the digestive system, as well as different types of um, diarrhea and then different infections that are associated with the digestive tract, whether it be um, viral, bacterial, or parasitic. Um, so just like our last exam, I do want you to be able to distinguish between the diseases and preventative measures, if mentioned, and then as well as treatment. Um, so with that, in order to help distinguish between them, know the hallmarks of them. So I did say some hallmarks on quite a few of them, so definitely pay attention to that in order to help you. Um, also take a look at the supplementary materials that is located on Canvas underneath um, modules. That will also give you an idea of some case studies on how to answer them, on how to pick out the context clues that can help you diagnose your patient. So if y'all have any questions, definitely contact. Um, if not, I will see y'all in class and thanks for sticking around.